So I'm Robert Hutchinson. I'm a member of the Save Ellen Balcourt campaign. We're a campaign of Ellen Estate residents and supportive neighbours who are campaigning to keep an inner city ball court in uh, Ellen Estate on Long Lane in Bermondsey uh, from development. Yeah, well, firstly, you don't build on ball courts, full stop. Um, uh, nobody's against council housing. We're in favour of more council housing and better council housing. Uh, but we say that you don't build on ball courts and you don't build on parks. They're off limits because in particular, in this particular case, the LM ball court is right in the middle of the most densely populated ward in Southwark. Um, it's invaluable as a community asset in its own right. Um, so we're, th we're looking at uh, children's mental and physical uh, health and well-being. Um, we're also looking at the problems around engagement and consultation. Uh, there hasn't been proper engagement. Uh, the consultation is sketchy at best. Um, so we're, we're, we're actually giving, amplifying the voice of uh, estate residents um, who are uh, against the development. I, I, I think the, the NIMBY, YIMBY labels uh, are, are reductive. Um, they've been traced back to pro, pro developer uh, corporations in the States. Um, uh, I think they're completely counterproductive to, to reduce the argument to those this kind of name calling. Um, as I've said, no, nobody's against quality social housing or building more social housing. And, and in fact, there are good opportunities to build on genuine brownfield sites. But this NIMBY YIMBY uh, label is being used uh, along with emotional blackmail about uh, social housing needs um, to basically enclose public public land, um, and and it's you know it's as serious as the enclosures of, of of past centuries, especially when some of the developments are even include private housing. So it is literally stealing from public land to to create private housing. So um, the solution to the housing crisis, which is a result of poor strategy and planning going back years, you know, if not decades, is not to rob Peter to pay Paul. I'm Harps Orgela. I'm a solicitor, um, a planning advisor at Southwark Law Centre, which is a charity in, in the centre of the borough in Peckham, but advises um, people across the borough on various matters. And I focus on planning. Um, we've got funding there for a project to provide advice, representation, advocacy, and just sort of community development um, in part organisation on planning issues in the borough. It's quite difficult in in the position that Southwark are in, I suppose, to answer this question, we need to sort of look at so that being a pawn in a wider defunct system now and there are some policies in place but they're not enforced against the pursuit of profit of developers often or you know enough to offset the damage that those rampant development has caused um so i see a for, sort of more fair and equitable sustainable um policy being just reversing that on its head and really putting people's needs at the heart of planning and planning definitely on public land. If you repurposed all the empty homes in the borough, for example, you wouldn't meet all of the housing need. But at the moment, there's development going on that is tower blocks of 60, 65% unaffordable properties, which are likely to still remain empty. And that fundamentally is wrong. And on public land there's still pressure to sell it to developers, have them build and then sell back the affordable 30, 35% um, social affordable housing. I, I just think that system isn't serving the need that we clearly have and that needs to change. And councils need to start by keeping their own land and working with their communities on what is built. Yeah, it's been really inspiring how the campaigns have connected up uh, over the last maybe six 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 months or so, um, so we've been sharing support, we've been sharing information, um, we've been sharing tactics, 
Um, and also, you know, it, it's it's a really good um, opportunity to to make to to see that you fit into some kind of a bigger picture and and that you're not alone. Yes. Yeah, so we focus on a number of things at Southwark Law Centre, which has sort of been honed by the the support that has been asked for of the project since it began in 2017 because actually in its inception it was kind of a novel project no other law center in the country does this kind of work but we knew that there was a need um for advice on on these matters because people were getting letters um and not knowing how to respond to them and and yeah it was in the aftermath of some controversial estate developments in Southwark and that coupled with engagement and um thorough equality impact assessments in in planning applications. A little bit of a reflection of the situation we've been put in um, and a push to have a more open conversation about what we do with public land, the little that is left in Southwark. And this is after a history of a lot of selling off of large-scale um, estate land. Um, but we're in the situation we're in, but there are other mechanisms to sort of get out of it. And... I do think I really agree with Rob that you do have to question where these accusations are coming from. And often when you do look into who's calling you a NIMBY, it really is quite revealing. I think it's really important uh, to call a park a park, to call a garden a garden. And what's happening is the developers tend to use words like sites um, to, you, you know, um, to describe parks. So there's um, Peckham Green at the moment in, in uh, just, just around the corner in Peckham. Um, it's described at the flag, as the flax yard site, um, which was actually really confusing in the consultation process. So many people didn't realise it, it related to, to, to their park that they, that they use every day. So I think language is really important um, and to, to call out um, the, 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 the misuse of language or misuse of labels by developers. It's so confusing language is really used to keep people in the dark oh you were sent a letter you had 21 days to respond and people just don't relate to the language that's used in the letters at all also it's to do with the use of land as not a public good but a private commodity sold traded and in a borough like ours that commodity has ever increased in value but that value is a pure sort of market value what profit can be made but not actually the value of how people use it and how it matters to their life and well-being and what I've really noticed now being able to speak to people again more meet with people um, since our last lockdown that has really made people look around them and see that a lot of what is happening isn't for them. And also it, it seems like madness, really. So many people have said, we'll look back in 10 years at what's going on and just say, you know, it was it was complete madness. And that is because land is scarce. It's bought and traded as a commodity and it's, it's on that system. It's not meeting the needs of the of people and that's kind of the way I see the essence of it so say the Peckham Green site which we worked through the campaign is there that could have really been developed into an, a green space that that area of the borough could have really benefited from and it could have also provided a bit of housing I mean we could discuss the proposals but it was really just seen as a development opportunity even from like 20, 25 years ago, where there wasn't the money to develop on it or there wasn't the proposals, it was sort of just left until proposals could be brought on it. And in the interim period, people were using it and people could more people could have used it if it was developed more as a park. But that just isn't done because there's an idea that at some point we can go into partnership with a developer to bring some revenue in and maybe meet a bit of housing need, but it's more really about that revenue and that expense of the land, why that area wasn't protected as a park or open space. In a development of 32 flats, we're being told, well, if we don't build on the ball court, that's a loss of 16 flats. Well, actually, no, it's a potential gain of 16 flats on the garages side. Um, so th the numbers get twisted around, and th and then on on elephant, I don't know the exact figures, but I think twelve hundred um, council uh, homes have been replaced by less than a hundred. 
Um, and, you know, it, it's quite a nice park there and the fountain's quite nice, but it's very busy already in summer and that's before full occupancy of the site. So, you know, why should people on estates uh, lose out on the few facilities that they've got? Estate residents have been asked to give up a lot and, you know, it's no surprise that people are are saying this is too much because, you know, we have a drive and we won't go into this now, but there's a drive to have less cars in the borough. There are merits to that. So less parking spaces, less garages. And where it's infringing also on any open space that is just for sitting and talking to your neighbours, um, it's it's a lot for, to give up when these estates were planned with parking spaces, garages, green space, play space, benches, uh, you know, greenery, trees, they were planned in that way because it contributed to a good quality of life. We may have moved away from cars and giving um, garages and there could be a compromise there potentially, but, you know, are we really saying that people shouldn't have a place to sort of just walk and sit and in their courtyard of their estate? I think. The question of being underused, these are invaluable spaces in a city centre. Surely these spaces should be promoted there are many different uses for outdoor spaces like Ellen Court it could be used for Tai Chi, for yoga. They're kind of left. So the use that is there is just kind of natural organic use. Mm. But spaces like Ellen Court should be promoted and, you know, actively used and, and creatively used.